Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Welcome aboard the Battleship Texas. Uh, I'm Rusty Bloxham, and I've got the job I've been wanting all my life. I'm the historian on this ship. Has anybody been here before? No. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've got a couple of battleship sailors here. That's good. Uh, we're going to walk around on the main deck here for about 30 minutes and take a look at the different guns on the ship. Hope you took care of business before you got here because we don't have any public restrooms on the ship. But if you want some water, this area we just came through that we call the Air Castle has got a water fountain in it. Uh, I like to start here where we are because from where we're standing you can see every kind of gun that was on the ship in 1945. And guns are what the battleship's all about. The gunners blasted the battleship Texas place in history with fire and thunder. <laughs> this ship is what's called a dreadnought battleship. That's the type of battleship that we're building early in the 20th century. And it's called that because the first one was from the British Royal Navy, HMS Dreadnought. And the ships that came after that that were similar were just called dreadnought types. We're the last one left anywhere in the world, the last dreadnought. This ship was put in the water in 1912. It was commissioned into the Navy as a battleship in 1914. So any way you measure it, this ship is over 90 years old. And she's been floating for most of that time. We're floating now. I always tell people, if I look half as good as she does when I'm 90, if you have to paint me blue, paint me blue. <laughs> okay, if you want to get an idea, just a frame of reference for the size of the ship, look right over the bow of the ship there at the San Jacinto Monument. And this is assuming it's not a foggy day. The San Jacinto Monument is 570 feet tall. The ship is 573 feet long. So if we were standing up next to the monument, we'd be three feet tall. Now this is the only battleship that's left anywhere that was in World War I and World War II. She didn't see any action in World War I, but during World War II she fired these big guns and the other guns in the invasion of North Africa, the invasion of Normandy, the invasion of southern France, and then out to the Pacific for the Battle of Iwo Jima and the Battle of Okinawa. And the ship has all kinds of different guns on it. The guns devastated the enemy, but a lot of these guns were there to protect the ship. Now, we'll get back to the 14-inch guns, the big guns. That's the reason the ship was built. We'll get back to those. The other kind of gun that was built on the ship when she was first new were these 5-inch guns that we walked past in the covered area. And when the ship was built, there were 21 of those 5-inch guns. And most of them were on the deck below where we are. You see the, how the hull kind of wrinkles and and looks funny. That's where there used to be a five inch gun down below us. And they started taking some of those guns off just within a couple of years. Because they were put aboard with the idea that the ship might get attacked by smaller ships that get in under the range of the big guns and now you have to protect yourself. And they were thinking torpedo boats. Small ships to carry torpedoes. That threat just didn't develop that much. There were a couple of other things that happened too. The ship was commissioned in 1914, just before World War I started. And by the end of World War I, it was real clear that airplanes were going to be more of a threat than torpedo boats. When the ship was designed, they didn't think about airplanes. And these 5-inch guns are old guns. They only elevate about like that. They can't shoot at an airplane, and they can't be modified. They're supposed to shoot at ships. It's going to take a real cooperative airplane pilot to fly into that bar. <laughs> and so they started taking those guns off. And another reason was this ship was a lot more active in rough weather than they had anticipated. She wasn't a real good sea boat. We've got pictures of the deck we're standing on right here with about five inches of water running on it because she's plowed into a wave. Now what does that mean for the five inch guns down below us when we've got five inches of water running here? They were underwater. water. And they only had little steel shutters to keep out the rain and the spray, but not the old gray lady herself. And so two of these guns were up in the officer's wardroom. That's where they eat and socialize. I think about after the third or fourth time that they were having a nice dinner in the officer's wardroom, and all of a sudden they plunged, and the ocean came in. Those were two of the first guns that were taken out. <laughs> but realistically, the, those guns were designed for a ship that had out, outlived the purpose of the guns. And so eventually they reduced it to the six that you see here. The three inch guns, you see the one barrel gun up here on the next level? Those are the first anti-aircraft guns that were put aboard.
That was in 1916. They were already seeing that that, that threat was developing. That's a single shotgun. In other words, you load one shell in and you fire. The 40 millimeter guns right up here above us that are mounted in groups of four. Those were anti-aircraft guns that were put aboard during World War II. They may not look like it, but that's a machine gun. It's an automatic cannon that fires a shell about that big around that explodes. And these little guns right here behind me, the 20 millimeters, those are also anti-aircraft guns. And they fire fully automatic too. It's another machine cannon. You don't think of a machine gun shooting explosive shells, but both the 40 millimeter and the 20 millimeters did. Now the sound of the guns would have been something to hear. Every time one of these guns fired, you got a flash of flame. You could smell that, that pungent, spicy smell of burnt gunpowder. But the sound of the guns was really something. Uh, the big guns, there was a guy who was on a battleship. Uh, he kept a diary. His name was Brian. And he described what the different guns, how it affected him when he was on deck. He said the big guns, when they fire, it's like you got hit by a truck. But the truck's wrapped in mattresses, and it's going slow. So it's not pleasant, but it's survival. The five-inch guns, it's like somebody took a two-by-four and bounced it off the back of your head. That crack. His ship didn't have three-inch guns, but our crew veterans tell us that if you were in the wrong place when one of those three-inch guns fired, it's like somebody's behind you with a couple of ice picks waiting and jabbing you when they fire. Now, Brian said that these 40 millimeters, well, when they fired, it was like you're listening to a trolley car with a couple of flat wheels somewhere because they go thump, 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 thump. And he said that these little 20 millimeters, when they fired, that means the enemy planes are close enough you're not worried about what they sound like. Grab your helmet and your life jacket. <laughs> and this is all back before they had hearing protection. You know, I learned when I was aboard Battleship Iowa carrying my hearing protection, earplugs. But the guys would go down into medical and get cotton balls, a lot of them, and screw those into their ears. Some of them didn't do it at all. You may notice a lot of World War II veterans kind of hard of hearing, Navy veterans. Now the big guns, we can't show you all of the turret. They're mounted in turrets. We got 10 of them and five turrets. Uh, you can go up into turret one here, climb up the ladder, you can get into the turret captain's cabin, you can look into the gun rooms. There's room for about two people up in there. It helps if you like each other. But you still just see a tiny little part of the turret. Most of the turret goes down into the ship about five levels. And while these guns were firing, what was happening inside the, each turret was like an agitated fire ant hill. And you didn't have a lot of room. Seventy men per turret. And they're all having to move around and, and uh, you know, take care of not just the machinery, but the ammunition and get out of each other's way. Uh, loading the guns for the shell, the projectile, you saw when you came aboard, that was pretty straightforward. There was a hoist like an elevator. It was all the way down to the bottom, and it brings the shell up right to the gun. You cradle it over, and there's a power rammer that shoves that into the barrel. Each one of those shells, depending on the type, weighs 1,275 pounds or 1,500 pounds. So every time you shoot one of these big gun shells, it's like you take a Volkswagen car and throw it 13 miles away, and then it blows up when it gets there. The powder, though, the powder that it took to fire the ship, you had to have four bags of powder, propellant powder. Each bag weighs 105 pounds. The hoist for the powder doesn't stop, it stops two levels down. That means that somebody, the sailors, for every shot, four bags, has to pick up 105 pounds, lift it to the next level, and somebody else has to lift it up. And when you get there into the gun house, there's no power rammer for the powder bags. They have a wooden ramrod, just like in the days of sail, master and commander. And that's one of the 19th century features you can find on our ship. The 19th century is all over this ship. Uh, once they've done that, you can fire both guns. That's eight powder bags. They try to get a shot out of each gun every 45 seconds, more like every 90 seconds. Anybody got any questions? Like I said, the gunners on the ship. Yes, sir. I got a question. Why did they use a wooden ram? They didn't trust. This is where you got the 19th century. The guys who designed that ship were 19th century guys. When they were 20 years old, they were on a wooden frigate. 
And this new powder was very volatile. They didn't trust a power rammer. They wanted to do it slow with muscle power. The gunners blasted this ship's place into history. This ship is not just steel and wood. There's a part of every sailor and every marine who ever heard these guns fire that's still here. One thing that I hope you get from what I'm saying is that we love this old dreadnought. If you want to be part of this, I've got some cards that will give you information on how to become one of our volunteers to help with the restoration, leading tours like I'm doing now. If you want to help out another way, we've got donation boxes back by the quarter deck where we came aboard. And if you just want to take something home, down at the ship store there, you can get books, videos. You probably saw all the cool souvenirs they have down there. Thanks for coming to see us. If you have any more questions, stop me on deck if you don't see me. Have one of the rangers call me on the radio, and we'll talk some more. Thank you.